Danny Cowell here with Next Play Academy and, and George Stahl, and we have another one of our leadership videos we're putting together. And today, we're joined outside, our first outside interview, with Ansley Davenport. Ansley, I, I know a lot about you in the past. You've been doing some great things here. Um, George, why don't you introduce Ansley a little bit yeah. for everybody? Um, so, Ansley and I go back from back in high school. We met freshman year. Ansley played basketball for me, and. Um, and she not just played basketball, she played, uh, she ran track, played soccer, you know, did a little bit of everything in high school, three-sport athlete, and had quite the career in basketball, I know, and obviously, you know, I got to see all that firsthand, but I know she had quite the career in track and, and uh, soccer as well, too, but more importantly, she's had, she's continued that, you know, to have quite a career into college and going to Army and, uh, at West Point and everything, so um, if you can, Ansley, just kind of tell us a little bit about, I guess maybe just what your resume would look like if you had to do like a one minute resume explanation, you know, for everybody of what, you know, college has looked like for you. Okay, um, so I just graduated uh, here in June, um, played handball all four years, entirely new sport that I learned as soon as I got there, mm -hmm. uh, so that was a learning process. Um, while I was at West Point, I had the opportunity to get my airborne jump wings. So when I was a freshman going into my sophomore year, I got to go to airborne school and jump out of airplanes. So that was a fun experience. Mm -hmm. um, also got the opportunity to earn my um, advanced diver certification um, just last summer. Um, as well as participate in other training events, I got to shadow an, an aviation officer last summer in Hawaii for three weeks. So that was super cool. And up next for me is Fort Rucker, Alabama, where I will go to flight school and learn to be a pilot. Very good. So, that's awesome. Yeah, super excited. Yeah, thank, thank you for doing this today, too. It's, yeah, of course. so much going on. Um, I know George is going to ask, ask this, but I, I got to ask you this. I know you got in the handball, never played before. Can you kind of tell everybody that story, how that ended up kind of organically happening? Yeah, so um, at West Point, you, um, you have to participate in some sort of sport. So that could be... Um, intramurals, it could be um, D1 sports or um, club sports. So handball, it's considered a club sport. Um, and so when I got there freshman year, I was kind of interested in trying out for basketball, maybe some other sports, and I came across handball because um, I knew my brother had talked about it when he was at the academy. Um, he knew of a lot of uh, ex-handball players that were really into it, hand-eye coordination kind of sport. Um, and I decided to go out for it the spring of my freshman year. So I showed up one day to these tryouts, me and a bunch of new girls, and on that day they were like, all right, these are the rules. Um, here are some drills and kind of just, like a lot of other things, just yeah. learn on the spot kind of thing. So those um, who aren't familiar with handball, with, uh, it's a combination of soccer, basketball, mm -hmm. you were a heck of an athlete in high school, combined it all those skills. W w can you give us just the basics of what it is? So I mostly describe handball as soccer with your hands um, or kind of water polo if you want to um, equate it to that. Um, there's six people on the court as well as one goalie and then um, you have a certain amount of steps that you can take. You can also dribble um, but there's a limited amount so you can take three steps, dribble, but once you pick it up you can't dribble anymore. Um, and then you want, there is an arch arc around the, uh, the goal six meters out and you can't enter that arc unless you are the goalie. Okay. So, right. what position did you play? I played. It's called center back, and it's basically like a point guard. Um, you're in the middle of the court. You're you're running the plays, kind of controlling the tempo, um, doing that sort of that sort of job. So. Cool. Yeah, that is cool. You know, it's it got me thinking. You've said all those sports that you played in high school, and you caught on the handball. You know, pretty quick. Is there so? I guess kind of to get into to West Point um, and everything over your last four years, is there anything that you feel like that you haven't caught on to as quickly that has been just kind of an extra challenge for you? Like I said, it's been, sports have been something that's come natural to you in your life. What's, is there anything that's specifically that sticks out in your mind that has been just more of a challenge for you that just wasn't as easy and didn't click right away, but you ended up you know, ended up working out the long run. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the cool things about being at West Point is you're going to find something that you're not good at. West Point is pretty good about finding that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it's a good thing you know sometimes at, at first it definitely comes across as like you, you're struggling um, but because you are able to find that thing that you are struggling at is you can find how to overcome that um, in West Point there's so many different aspects so I know um, just like academically there were certain classes that you know you aren't you don't click as well um, and it's also it's a different teaching style so at, at West Point there's what's called the Thayer method and it's basically um, you are to complete the assignment the night before class and you know it's anywhere from they say about two hours for every hour of class in order to prepare for it and you go in class and you ask the teacher questions um, so there are certainly some classes that I had never um, never learned like certain subjects so for example like physics was something I never learned um, I didn't really learn it in high school I knew like the basics but then you get to West Point and it's like first day like I, I think I had a quiz the first day and so he's asking these questions I have no idea what some things are um, so learning process in that in certain subjects and um, learning how to ask for help um, and the studying habits and the time how to dedicate yourself to those things that you are struggling at as well as um, one class in particular, what sticks out is it's called survival swim. And it's basically what it sounds like, survival swimming. Um, and so like, I, I consider myself a pretty average swimmer, um, no like competitive swimmer by any means, but I know how to swim. And, but it's a different, different process learning to swim with like your full uniform on, your boots, you have, um, you have like your equipment, a rifle. And so I remember the first few days of learning to do that did not, go as well as I planned at all. Um, I was one of those people who sank straight to the bottom, was not very good at floating. Yeah. Um, so that process, I joke about it now that I think I swallowed more pool, pool water than anybody. Um, but you know, you have extra, we call them AI sessions, additional instruction that you'd go in, um, work with teachers, work with other students, and over time getting in reps, I really, really learned how to, you know, better prepare myself for the class. And you know, by the end of it, I was, you know, able to do things that I never thought I could have done. Right. So. All of, were all of your classes that method, that same way? Yes, everything is the Thayer method, yes. So you are responsible for um, learning, the, learning the knowledge or learning, um, you know, that subject for, or that lesson, and then you come in and you ask questions. That's cool. So. A lot of self-discovery, problem solving. Definitely. Ways, the different skills that mm -hmm. obviously are going to help you in what you're doing now. Yep. Right. So how did those I, transfer over to the handball court? So, you know, you're, you're learning a lot of toughness, self-discovery, getting through problems. How does that transfer over to what you were doing on the handball court? What were some challenges you had there? Um, so just as I learned, like, during the academic year and during the summers with the military leadership, um, with the sports teams, you also have a lot of opportunities for leadership within them within themselves. Um, and so on the handball team, um, you, you're not only playing the sport and you're responsible for you know, the practices and showing up and holding yourself accountable, but you also have a different role in the team. So um, on every team you have administrative roles. So each person might be in charge of um, you know, setting up the transportation for different trips, um, the food, you're just on the logistical side. And then as you become more of an upperclassman, you take on a bigger role. Um, whereas like junior year, I was co-captain. Um, and so I was responsible for running tryouts, running practices day in, day out. And at the same time, I'm trying to, you know, deal with everything on my right. cadet side, like the right. academics. And also, I, I'm trying to help teach the newer girls who haven't been exposed to the sport. Mm -hmm. um, and also still trying to practice, you know, as a, as a player myself. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so with handball, I learned so many different leadership aspects there, like being a co-captain and, you know, from a plea, which is what we call a freshman, you, you know, your, your job is to, you know, take care of the equipment, pit, get the goals out, um, put them back, that's your job. And as you rise, you take on more of that leadership role and, you know, you're learning it based on the people before you. Right. Um, it's not necessarily, there's no rule book, there's no guidelines. Yeah. You're learning from others. Right, because so. uh, what I gather from between school and handball and I'm sure other sports everybody played their goal is it seems like you gotta they're giving you the ability to take the initiative yourself you have to take the initiative or else you'll fail and mm -hmm. you have to you have to be able to lead whether it's by example but is that were you heading into your freshman year were you did you feel out of out of place taking that extra initiative with classes handball have you 
felt that leadership, you know, develop in, inside of you over those four years? You know, have you felt like you improved at that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, from, from freshman year, definitely it was an adjustment. Um, I wouldn't say I necessarily ever felt out of place. I think from the start, like, I knew that's, that's what I wanted to do, and I knew that place, West Point, was the place for me. Um, there were certainly times where, you know, I'm, I was thinking to myself, like, what am I doing right now? Not necessarily in a bad way, whereas, you know, like, why do I want to be here? Um, which just kind of, like, looking back on things that I was doing, it, like, makes me laugh. I always tell you the story about when I was in the middle of the woods at, like, 3 in the morning, we were doing what's called a patrol base, um, and, you know, it's pouring rain, and I'm just laying there, and I'm, like, thinking to myself, like, oh, my goodness, like, what am I doing right now? Um, but you look to the people left and right of you that, that help you make it through. Um, and I've seen myself grow so much, you know, from plebe year, um, just in terms of, like, I'd say the biggest thing is, like, finding my voice and kind of finding my leadership style. Mm -hmm. um, from freshman year, I've definitely learned over the years. Um, working on, like, communication, that's the biggest, biggest thing I've learned. Right. Can you tell us that, tell us that story from beginning to end of what that, because I remember you reflecting back. It's mm -hmm. or of how far you've come, like you said, from then until now. But that was your freshman year, right? Yes, that was. And now the very beginning of, beginning of freshman yes, year? Yes, that was the summer, uh, maybe three weeks into being um, a cadet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, I was technically a new cadet because I wasn't, um, I had not finished what's called Beast. So um, before West Point, you have six weeks of basic training. Uh, we call it Beast. And so... The first six weeks, the first three weeks we break it down is you basically learn how to be a cadet. Um, so you're, you're living in the barracks, um, you're learning how to march, you're learning how to, you know, wear the uniform, salute, those kind of things. Um, and then the last three weeks, it's a bunch of uh, field exercises. Um, you're learning your shooting, you're doing land navigation, um, you're running missions, you're learning more of the, more of the Army tactics in the woods, um, kind of things we think about in the Army. Um, so I want to say this is probably the, the first or second week of that field training. So probably four or five weeks in, have a couple weeks left before I get, um, in, what you want to call, I guess, initiated or you are received within the Corps of Cadets to earn the status of cadet. Um, so I'm a new cadet. I've been there for four or five weeks. And um, one of the missions, it's, it's called running a patrol base. Um, and basically you're set up in a triangle uh, with, three different points and you have a squad on each side of this triangle and then your weapons squad which is like your heavy machine guns um, they're set up at each apex so basically um, your patrol base helps you rest refit um, you always have somebody on on guard while other people are sleeping um, or taking care of their weapons that kind of thing and so with this this mission um, typically it's about a third of the people are going to be awake at any given time and so I remember it was in the middle of the night, maybe two or three in the morning. Um, you know, it's it's July, it's hot, it's rainy. And so I remember, I think it was maybe like the third day of being straight out in the field. You know, you're not going back and showering every night. You're staying in your clothes. You're kind of gross. You're sweaty. Um, and it just starts pouring rain. And I'm laying in the mud, you know, in the prone position with my rifle. You know, I say rifle, it is an M4, but um, you have this device at the end. It allows you to shoot blanks. Um, and so I have my rifle and I'm laying there and it starts pouring and I'm freezing and the water, I remember it got so bad, like people's stuff started to float away and I'm just laying there and I'm kind of like thinking to myself, you know, like, like, what am I doing right now? I'm laughing cause like I'm thinking about the people back home and I'm like, no one would ever believe this right now or no one would ever think of doing this. Like I didn't think I was going to do something like this. Um, but then like while I was laying there, I was thinking, you know, looking because I had somebody awake close by in case anything happened um, and I was thinking about the fact that no matter the fact that we were all from all over the country um, some people from different countries in the world we were all there for the same reason going through the same training and you know most of us had you know no training like they were the same as me like I hadn't done anything like this before and so it was really neat to kind of like reflect on that, think about it, you know, like we're all coming from different backgrounds, but we're here for the same thing and we're doing the same thing. And that was a really cool feeling that, you know, as I was thinking about it more, it's like not many people can say they've, 
been through something like that before where you've kind of sacrificed, you know, sleeping in a bed, you know, to like lay on the ground and, you know, you're learning to eventually do these things and lead other soldiers to do the same. And so that was a really, that's a truly eye opening experience for me that I will remember. Because you're in that moment, you have others, you know, that are going through the same thing, like you said, but you're also going through that mental dialogue, Mm -hmm. you know, with yourself and you have to be able to stay strong mentally. Right. So what did that look like, that conversation in your head? You know, I guess you you can maybe not just that example, but other examples where you're facing just a lot of adversity in class through a handball. Mm Mm-hmm. Can you take me through what those conversations look like in your head sometimes? Yeah, um, I mean, you, I could say I have that sort of, you know, thought go through my head like on a daily basis um, with just different things that I'm doing because I was doing so many, you know, different things that, you know, you would never even think of doing. Um, just like even, you know, some things I didn't even have a, like a choice kind of thing um, where every hour of the day is regimented, you know, like if you don't show up for this, this duty or this formation, like, you're in trouble like that's where you're supposed to be right. and it's like you don't have a choice yeah. um and so a lot of the time I just I just thought to myself you know like you you think about the people who have gone before you and have done it and the people who have made even bigger sacrifices um especially during you know that story of when I was um you know doing a patrol base you know that was just an, an exercise like a practice like I knew in the in, you know in the back of my mind like this isn't you know I'm not in truly any danger mm-hmm. and so thinking about Um, you know, those, the veterans and everything that have sacrificed so much and are truly in dangerous situations themselves was a lot, that went through my mind a lot, um, knowing you kind of like embracing the suck and, you know, suck it up, like people have it, have worse situations. Um, and just like also the fact that I, I wanted to, um, to, you know, serve other people and sacrifice, you know, my time and my, like, I want that's that's something I wanted to do because I wanted to help people um and so I definitely you know thinking about you know others like what I wanted to do for them and then you know what they have done for me is something that got me through a lot of things so what's sticking out to me here is first off you talked about relationships and giving back and sacrifice and and thank you for all you're doing and and everybody in the army um but you're, you're telling me that It was almost fun to you that you were laying in the mud and it was, you know, wet and you felt like, you know, you were in a little bit of danger, you know, things floating around Mm -hmm. and you're in that class and you're literally drowning and you have all these, these challenges, these struggles, but now you're reflecting on it. It sounds like you've grown so much. Mm -hmm. Um, Like George said, you know, that, that, that mental dialogue inside your head. Do you feel like you're at the point now, like, what was that process like when you first started to where you are now that you feel like you could really take on anything and, and get through different struggles? Mm-hmm. Um, well, thinking back, like you said, like, I, I look back on all that things and I laugh because mm-hmm. during, you know, during the survival swim class and during the patrol base, like, it sucks. Like, you think you're, like, at the lowest point of your life, but then, you know, you get through it and you're like, okay, like, that wasn't so bad. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's those little victories and those little accomplishments over time that you're just like, okay, well, if I did that, you know, and this person did that, like, I can do this. Um, And, you know, it just makes me think of, like, other things that we did that just make me laugh. Um, Another story that that happened was, so during my, going into my junior year, we do what's called CLDT, and that's Cadet Leader Development Training. And essentially, um, you are put through missions and field exercises where you are the platoon leader or the platoon sergeant and my first job would be a platoon leader as as a after flight school I'll be a first lieutenant Um, so I'll be in charge of roughly 30 to 40 people and so with this specific training um, you're I was out in the field for 11 days straight with you know just the clothes that I was wearing and the clothes on my back Um, you're not you're not sleeping inside anywhere I think there was maybe one night where they let us set up like a little um, it's called a hooch like a you have a poncho and you like put it over your head and put it over your equipment and like that's about it. I think maybe one or two nights we had that um, because you're in a tactical environment. And so I remember one, it was day seven, I think, after a mission and it's the middle of the day um, and you have, there's two platoons. So I was waiting on our sister platoon to finish after, cause we went first. And so we're all sitting there and you have other 
um, actual commissioned officers that are leading you through the mission and um, they're evaluating you and at the end you have um, you sit down and you kind of talk about what went right what went wrong and you learn from it and so we had finished going over everything you learned I remember we're all just sitting there we're so tired you know we're cleaning our rifles and you know just kind of like in the dumps you know morale is kind of low and I'll never forget when the officer who was with our platoon helping us came around the corner and in his hand he was holding you know like an, a box of ice cream sandwiches <laughs> And in that moment, like, you, you just saw all the looks on our faces. And it was as if, you know, like, we, some of us wanted to, like, cry. And some of us were, like, just the biggest smiles. Because just that one little thing, yeah. like, made it so much better. Um, Things we take for granted. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, like, yeah. And, you know, it get, just goes back to, like, you know, I'm doing a field exercises. You know, field exercises. And other people are doing things ten times worse. And in that moment, like, the ice cream sandwich is, like, the number one thing I remember from... Yeah those field training exercises and you know it's I did that so like okay what can I do next right so yeah cool you know um kind of flash back here a little bit you know you've always been such a driven person to be able to go succeed in you know middle school all the way up to high school sports academically and now you know succeeding at West Point has that your work ethic is is just you know amazing, and I got to see that you know firsthand through coaching you in basketball. Um, is that is that something that came from? Is that easy for you? Because I, I know I mean knowing your parents, you got both your mom and dad are both strong, driven people, and I know that they probably set that example and that standard from when you were young. But at the same time, a lot of parents do that, and kids aren't as receptive to that. You know, but it's been, you know, from my point of view, it's been just easy for you in a way. You know, you just you just pick up the next thing, you do it. Pick up the next thing, you do it. And it's like you don't blink an eye. It's amazing to me to watch you do that. How, and it sounds so simple, and I know it's not easy, but, mm -hmm. like, does that come to you inherently? Is there, you felt like that was something taught uh, you know what I mean mm -hmm. yeah, what are the, what, yeah. What are the struggles too that, that you have within that too? yeah um I, I definitely think my parents overall like set the foundation from the start for that work ethic you know I was always taught for you know you work for what you're going to get um it's not going to be handed to you and I also um think it comes from you know I was always very active when I was younger I was competitive gymnast for um a very young portion of my life and so I think I started when I was maybe eight or nine and up until middle school. Um, you know, from the, from the start, I was competing. I was commuting to Lexington, driving an hour and a half for a four-hour practice four or five times a week. Um, and so, you know, I had my parents who, first of all, were able to, you know, put me in those, those lessons and sacrifice the time and the effort and money to um, get me to practice and get me to those competitions. And so... You know, I'm, I'm in the third or fourth grade, so very early on I learned about structure and that discipline and that hard work. And um, with a sport like gymna gymnastics where it's so dangerous, it was a lot of the times, you know, you, you learn early on um, how serious to take it. Um, there's a time to, like, joke around, but there's time to stay focused and get serious because you can get hurt. And so I think from a young start, you know, with, through gymnastics and my parents, I learned about just that work ethic and, you know, you needing to practice thousands of times before you per perfect something and I think with with competitions that kind of reinforced you know like hey I worked so long for it and it pays off um, my parents like to laugh and remind me of the fact that I think it was my my first ever competition where um, I did okay you know didn't get like top three or anything didn't get a trophy and I, I looked at my mom and I was like you know what like next competition like I'm getting a trophy and that season I walked away every single competition with a trophy <laughs> and so I think through practice in those competitions and my parents just kind of instilling that, you know, if, you, if that's what you want, you work for it, like no one's going to give it to you. Um, and I think that set the foundation for, for grade school and for high school and for West Point eventually because I knew I wanted to go to an academy um, early on by freshman year because I had my older brother, he went to West Point and graduated in 2016 and I remember um, even wrote about it in one of my essays because it meant so much when I first 
saw West Point, it was his, what we call our day or reception day. It's that first day of BEAST basic training. Um, they in-process you, they get all your information and you're gone for six weeks. You're cut off, you know, no, no contact, you communicate through letters. And I remember we had just dropped him off and for the rest of the day, you can walk around West Point and you can get little peeks of the cadets or the new cadets, you know, they're learning marching and they're being led around to different stations. And I remember one time I was looking through one of the sally ports, the tunnels into the main area because it's cut off from everybody else. Um, and I see all of these, you know, 18 year olds marching around following the cadet cadre, which is, you know, it's a kid two years older than you, leading and learning themselves and to kind of see them all like following them, you know, like ducks in a row, um, listening to commands and everything, you know, after only maybe an hour or two. And to see that discipline and then that structure and then at West Point, you know, as soon as you set foot, you can feel the history and the tradition and the camaraderie and everything it was just very impactful. Um, and I think, from, you know, from that moment, it was like a light switch that kind of went off and I was like, this is something I want to be a part of. Cool. And so from, from freshman year, I was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And that kind of set the precedent for like, okay, I, I'm gonna take, you know, like these classes, this is what's gonna prepare me for, um, you know, the Thayer Method. I knew a little bit about it because my brother. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, having that goal in mind, just like having, you know, the trophy in mind, like this is what I want. So like, I'm okay with, you know, I gotta put in the work, like it's gonna suck. There were certainly some high school classes even um, that required a lot of time and effort that, you know, you just have to think about, this is what I wanna do, this is what I need to, accomplish in order to get there. Um, so just having that goal in mind was definitely, definitely made the obstacles and the road bumps worth it. So. Did you have that, so it sounds like to me too, that, that self-discipline, that's what has separated, I feel like separated you growing up athletically, academically, and, and that's, I would say that, that positive self-talk, you know, because you, there's, I'm sure there has to be a bunch of times where it's like, I don't feel like doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a, something that a typical kid would go through, maybe a, a high school kid, you know, a middle school kid, that they don't have the discipline you know, to, do, to go out there when they don't want to do it. Um, so what would a, is there any certain advice along those lines or even you know, some little different what, what advice would you give, you know, a kid, fresh freshman, you know, boy or girl heading into high school and they want to play a certain sport or, or, or excel academically? What, what, what would it be advice that you would give them mm -hmm. in order to accomplish whatever goal that they have in mind? Make yourself do it, even though you you know you don't want to. Like it's gonna suck. Um, it sounds easy, like it's going to suck, but it's going to be worth it in the end. Um, one of the things that I found the most helpful was also have someone to hold you accountable. Um, there were a lot of times at West Point where you're so, you are dependent on other people to, to get you through it. Um, I'm, one of my teammates comes to mind. We wanted to, you know, work on our, our two mile run time. And so we would wake up at five in the morning and we would go run. And there were certainly times when it was cold and I was tired, I'd stayed up, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning working on homework and I didn't want to do it. Like I would wake up, even look at my phone and, and be very tempted to text her and be like, you know, like I'm not feeling it this morning. Um, and so kind of have someone to hold you accountable and have someone that's going to get through it with you is something that I think is really beneficial and really helpful. Um, and again, just to like, it's going to suck, but think about how much worth, you know, how worth it is it going to be in the end. Um, definitely thinking about those five in the morning runs was, was very, <laughs> it, was, it was rough getting out of bed some mornings, you know, and seeing my, my roommate sleeping right next to me, right. you know, um, but yeah, having her there and then, you know, in, in, in the end, like we, I improved my score so much, she did too. And, you know, you look back and you're like, you know, it wasn't that bad. Like right. I could do that. I could do it again. Yeah. Um, so kind of back to those relationships again too. Like yeah. Touch mom, that's great. Yep. We're, we're burning daylight here a little bit, so I want to make sure we talk about this. Um, you talk about accountability and whatnot. There's a there's a great story in Coach K's book about he's in his he's in his dorm room and he's walking to the to the caf, cafeteria. He's going to eat, and somebody walks by him and steps in some mud and some mud splashes on his foot and gets on his shoe. And 
he thinks to himself, if I get caught with, with mud on my shoes, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not, I'm not sure what point he was in, in his uh, years at, at the academy, but um, he decided to just keep going instead of going back and changing his shoes. Well, he got called out on it and got in trouble. And then he, he learned that day that he always had a choice. He had a choice to hold himself accountable in these small things. And I'm sure there are a ton of small things uh, that you're held accountable for the, these last few years. But what was it like? Tell us the whole Coach K concept that, you know, you meeting him and, and the award you got and mm -hmm. brag about yourself a little bit too. Don't be shy. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, no, it was it was awesome getting to speak with him a little bit. So um, I was uh, nominated by my peers, my uh, my teammates and my, my coaches for the um, Coach K. It's teaching character um, and excellence through sport. And I was named a finalist for the competitive club sports um, for handball. And so I, along with um, the other cadets who were nominated for intramurals and um, the coaching, coaches who got nominated, as well as the D1 athletes, um, we got to sit down over Zoom. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to meet them in person just with everything going on. Um, and we got an hour, about an hour, about an hour and a half to speak with him before the actual ceremony. Um, and we each got to go around and ask him a question. Um, and I thought in itself, like, that was pretty cool. Like, I'm going to get to speak to Coach K. Um, you grow up watching basketball. And so that was pretty cool in, ex in, in itself. Um, what was your question? I had asked him, you know, after all your years of coaching and your Army career, what is something that you wish you would have learned or known from the start? Um, and he had talked a lot about um, using those around you, like your coaching staff and, um, you know, avoiding um, micromanaging. Um, because at West Point, you know, and, you know, coaching too, you, you get caught up in a lot of things and you want to do it yourself. Um, but a feat in itself is learning, you know, how to divide up um, certain work and, and working together and using that teamwork. Um, you know, use people's strengths to your advantage um, because we're all still learning. And so I thought that was, that was pretty neat because, I, you know, it, over the years, especially when you become an upperclassman and you're filling leadership positions and you're responsible for more and more people, um, you can't do it all yourself. Yeah. Um, my senior year, I was a company commander, so I was ultimately responsible for roughly 130 people. Um, and it boils down to, you need to know where everybody is at any point in the day. Mm -hmm. And so, but the thing is, you're not doing everything by yourself. You have, um, you have a first sergeant that's responsible for X, Y, Z. You have an XO, which is an executive officer who does other logistical things. And so learning um, how to work with those around you for different roles is um, definitely something I've learned over the years. Of course, like I've learned from mistakes, um, yeah. but in the end, like, you know, you learn and you move on and hope to improve in the future. Yeah, absolutely. What questions you got on Coach K? I know you had a couple written down. Um, well, which kind of got me, you kind of hit on it there a little bit. So you were, in, you were in charge of over 130 people? Yes. You said? Mm -hmm. And then that, now once you, um, when you're at Fort Rucker, you said you'll have, you'll be in charge of 30, like a group of 30 people? So after I finish Rucker and flight training, um, when I get to my first unit, I'll, I'll uh, depending on, you know, if there's a position open, I might fill a staff position and do other things. But ultimately, I will be a platoon leader, and you're responsible for a platoon size element, um, which is roughly 30 to 40 people. Flight companies are a little bit smaller. Um, but yes, you are the highest ranking um, officer, highest ranking person for that element, that platoon. Mm -hmm. And so you're responsible for you know, their well-being, you're responsible for um, getting certain tasks done, different duties, like you are, um, like if anything goes wrong, like it's on you. Yeah, so, so are you, what's your long-term plan? Are you career military, have you decided yet? Or? Um, so. Leaving it open, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say I have anything set in stone. Um, I know I'll be in for at least 10 years following my obligation in flight school. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I won't, I won't say never say never. Right. Definitely leaving it open. Um, yeah. But also, you know, like I don't, I don't know what it's like to, you know, I got a little bit of a glimpse, you know, shadowing a, a platoon leader. Um, but, but I think I want to, you know, experience it for myself before I make any big decisions, you know, see where life takes me. and. Well, thanks for all you yes. doing. Thank awesome. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
That's all I got. Yeah, me too. And yeah, thanks yeah. for joining us on, on this too. Uh, yeah. Glad we could catch you while you're in town. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I geek out over the leadership stuff. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great stuff. Uh, thank, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was perfect. You did a good job. Oh. Um, Anything else? No. I mean, do you have any other stories or anything like that? That you, oh gosh, I have so many stories. Right. <laughs> Any stories um, like um, that, like kind of link into what we're doing, like in terms of any sort of almost all of your stories probably involve facing adversity in some mm -hmm. sort of way. Um, but any, but any of those that really stick out, anything like that anymore? And as, let me ask you this: you, they break you down when you get there. Yes. I mean, that's... You shave your head, you yeah, know, they yeah, take your hair for yeah. the guys and... But then they, then they build you back up. What's that, what's that like? What's that process like? And we've all been broken down to the point where, you know, we struggle so hard with, with something. But, I mean, that's a different level mm -hmm. of what they're doing. And you're the, you know, you've proven you're the elite of the elite. You're getting these awards with these, you know, and you're around people who are just as driven as you, but you're still getting through that. What, what's that like for you that seen all the success before you've gotten there and then you it just cut you down <laughs> and, but like you said you you get through and you learn. Mm -hmm. just explain that a little bit it's it's very humbling yeah. because you know um you you know a lot of people come from their high schools and everything you know being like this big fish in a small pond and then you get to west point and you're one of many you know everybody has very similar credentials to you, if not better. So it's very humbling in a sense from the beginning um, through Beast. It's, I'll talk, it's, it's a feeling of, you know, there are some priors who, who did serve and have some knowledge, um, but for the most part, you're all learning at that same base level. And so to kind of think about the fact that, you know, like, you know, maybe he's a little bit better at this than I am, but, you know, I was a little better at this and it's kind of like, okay, well, here, how can I help you with that? And have, building those relationships from the start are very, very important. Um, and so that was very encouraging to kind of lean on those people around you to help you in different aspects where you are struggling. Um, but to go from the start and you kind of, you know, the guys who get their head shaved, you know, you are losing that identity and you're putting, you know, this brand new uniform. Um, you, you, you are, you remember, I remembered a lot, you know, the bigger purpose that you're there for. And it kind of goes back to, as well, like those little accomplishments, um, doing those little things to kind of build you up to do the next big things. Like you get through week one, okay, I got through week one, like I can get through week two. Um, you know, when you get there, one of the things that I was most surprised about is how many of the different things where it was kind of like they teach you in a classroom and they throw you out there, you know, go try it, go do it, go fail. And then if you fail, learn from it and do it again and succeed. Um, you know, land navigation was one thing that I was, that shocked me the most. Um, you know, it's, they sit you down in the classroom, they teach you like, this is how you read a map, this is how you read the different lines, um, this is how you plot points, this is how you use a compass. Okay, so we're, you're gonna go out and do this. And so your first course, it's like six hours and you have to find a certain amount of points. And I remembered like, I wasn't the most, you know, directionally gifted person like I get from like A to B but you know not with a compass you know like my GPS phone um, and so I remember they had us all huddled around you know they have the map of the area they give you a tracking advice or a device so they always know where you are um, but you're by yourself so they're like six hours like here are your points plot them go find them and so I was like for a second like, like stunned I was like oh and then you know by the way there's bear there's bears out there there's snakes I saw a bear the first time I went out there, <laughs> completely like scared me. Like I ran off course, got lost for a little bit until I found my way back again. There. Um, so yeah, there's like wildlife. Um, but then, you know, like I find my first point. I'm like, okay, well I found the first point. I must've been doing something right. And then you find your second point. And it's like those little things along the way. There's a small victories that you're like, okay, so now I can get the third point. You know, and while you're, you're by yourself, but you still see, you know, like 20 yards that way, I see another cadet walking. Um, so you're, you're alone, but you're not alone in the sense where you know other people are doing the same thing you are. And, you know, throughout the whole time, it was a little victory. It's like, yes, I found this point. And so you go to the next point. And then you complete, you're like, hey, I passed land nav. And so you move on to rifle qualification. You know, they're handing you live ammo. Um, and it just keeps building on those little victories. And you're like, that's great. 
Um, Definitely gets you through it. You know, one of my favorite things about uh, playing sports as you grow up is it teaches you how the importance of being a teammate. You, like you said, everybody's there for that collective goal. You know, when you're on a team, whether you're at West Point, everybody's you know there you know for their goal. And um, has is there any example of you being a great teammate to where things that you've done specifically to help out? you know, one of, one of your teammates there that kind of sticks out where you feel like that you went above and beyond to help somebody who really needed it? Oh, um, yeah, I can, I can um, think about, you know, just handball, different things, as well as, you know, military um, exercises. You know, with handball, it wasn't always about the skills and the, the technical aspects, but more of, you know, the relationship side um, and even the academic side where I would, you know, sit there and help somebody who was struggling in a certain class because you, you can't play if your grades aren't good. Yeah. Um, so I'd help in that aspect or I'd have um, different positions for handball. You'd have girls, like there were some girls who were learning my position, so you know, you know, we're practicing like, hey, maybe try this where I can add my two cents, where I kind of know a little bit more of experience like over the years from what I've learned where I think, you know, helped them um, improve. Um, to being a teammate in that, at that aspect. And then, you know, during different summer training where I talked about CLDT, where you take turns being in charge of 30 to 40 people, um, being a teammate was the most important part of that training, I would say. I mean, of course, the leadership aspect of, you know, being that leader and planning the mission and executing it. But if anything, you know, I would always tell people, be a good teammate. Like you can, not be the best person like rucking which is carrying all your stuff and all the equipment you may not be able to carry as much you know weight as the person behind you but you can still have a better attitude or you can be willing to say like hey i'll i'll stay up for this shift if you need to get sleep like so being a good teammate was definitely the most important part of that aspect because you know when you take turns of being in charge you remember like who helped you here and who didn't help you here and during those those 11 days of being out in the field, you know, you, you form that bond with those people, you know, who you don't know who they are. Um, I was a junior when I did it, and most of the time it's, it's mostly senior, incoming seniors who do it. And so I felt a little hesitant at first just because I hadn't taken a certain military class that they all had to prepare for it. Um, but by the end of it, like, it didn't even matter because they were so willing to, you know, help me. They're like, hey, like, they learned about it so they were able to you know show me some of the ropes and and help me in those aspects whereas you know okay when it was my time to be the follower like I'll be the follower I like just you know do what they say maybe if they need some help offer your two cents but at the end of the day you know like they're in charge and you know like being a good follower of a good teammate was yeah. the most important part of that training yeah that's great so. that's good stuff right there well thank you again thanks for what you're doing thanks for doing of course. Thank you for having me.